Right, 11 o'clock. How are you guys doing? Come on, you got more sleep than 9.30 and they were louder than you. How are you doing? Awesome. We're going to have a lot of fun together. And uh, today is an awesome, awesome day because today, October 31st, is Diana's birthday. Yeah, you didn't know what I was going to say there. Some of you were ready to send me an email. Okay, you knew what it was. Yes, these are skeletons on my sweatshirt. And yes, this sweatshirt reminds me that Jesus opened the grave. Give us some praise for that, all right? And uh, I don't know what you call today, but let's have a little fun. Let me offend most of you in the room. Um, and you can email joe at blazechurch.org. <laughs> uh, I got this, this meme from a pastor friend of mine. Who I, was just, I just left. And uh, so here we go. I don't know what you call today, but you have uh, Trunk or Treat, Jesus Ween, Fall Fun Fest, Hallelujah Night, Pumpkin Party, Harvest Fest, or Halloween. Okay, so I just a little laugh. You can laugh a little bit. It's okay. It's okay to laugh in church. I personally, I like the Hallelujah Day. That's just a good Hallelujah Day. Um, but we're going to have some fun. We got some pumpkins outside. In the 930, the grass was so wet, it was actually a slip and slide for the kids. It's fun. So you guys are the 11. You're a little smarter. The grass is a little dry. But if you got Blaze kids, uh, kids over there, make sure you go pick a pumpkin, get some candy on your way out. And uh, it's just, just going to be a fun day. But we're starting this series today called Seed to Seeds. And the reason why we're going to spend the next four weeks on learning how to grow in radical generosity is because of the moment that takes place every single week at Blaze Church Services where as a church, we all make a declaration together. And I know what you is, know, I know you know what it is because we just did it. So what kind of a church are we? We are. Right. Yes. So we say that every single week. And it's to just, just think and pray and say, you know, as a church, we make this declaration and we know it's true. We are radically generous as a church. Because we continue to bless other churches, other organizations. Just yesterday, we had so many kids come to our building for a trunk or treat event. Yeah, it was awesome. And, and so many families were just blessed by that. And we didn't let the rain stop us. We said, we'll just move it inside. And uh, it was beautiful. It's radical generosity. But it caused us to say, you know, we are radically generous. But I wonder how many of us could answer this question. Am I radically generous? So this one's going to be a little uncomfortable, everybody. For the next four weeks, we're going to get, we're going to get a little bit, we're going to poke around a little bit in an area that I know there's, there's so much skepticism around this area of finances and the church. In fact, even with the, the series title, Seed to Seeds, some of you, like, you're, you've got such bad experiences with this. Like, you're just waiting for me to just, you know, bust out some kind of a, a preacher voice, and you got to sow your seed. And today, if you sow, then you're going to reap a heart. Like, you just, okay, I'm not going to do any of that, okay? My wife's shaking her head. She's like, calm down. Just, okay, so, so. If you've got some PDS, PS, whatever that is, SD, whatever, somebody help me out there. If you got that, this is not that, okay? Uh, you know that about our culture here at Blaze Church. In fact, the seed that we're talking about throughout this series isn't even your financial seed. It's actually you. I'll say that again. You are the seed that we're talking about. See, we believe that we are called to be radically generous, that God has actually planted you here in this world for a purpose, and it's to be a multiplier. That's what it means to go from seed to seeds, that you have this potential and this reach to make a difference in people's lives. And when we live radically generous, we start to impact people around us. We go and make disciples. Now, your finances are a part of that. And Jesus said you can either serve God or, what do you say? Money, because money tends to be the number one contender for your heart's worship. So we're going to discover for four weeks how we can grow in radical generosity. Now, today is pretty cool for me. I've been pastoring Blaze Church for six years now, and I feel like I'm hitting a milestone today, like I'm reaching a benchmark. I'm setting a new PR, because I have never preached with mustard seeds in my hands, and now I get to you today. Come on, how awesome is that? I feel like every pastor at some point has to have a jar of mustard seeds to talk about seeds and money, so today's my day, and nobody's going to take it away from me, not even the birthday girl. I'm excited for this day, but these seeds are just, they're so tiny, and I know it's hard for you to see them, so we've got a picture here of what that would look like to hold just one of these seeds in your hand. And as you look at this seed, which the reason why I chose this is twofold. One, Jesus actually said the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. 
but also it is still one of the tiniest seeds that we have. And oftentimes we'll look at this and say, I mean, what potential do you have? I'll just rub you into some corned beef at St. Patrick's Day. That's the only time I ever see mustard seeds, a little packet and got to rub it in there. Every one of these seeds has the potential to become a tree in the right conditions. In fact, look at this slide. This shows you the, the height of a tree. A mustard seed can grow upwards of 20 feet. Like, that's crazy. The God of the universe created that. Like, I would never look at this and think, wow, every single one of you has the potential to become a 20-foot seed-bearing tree. So as we talk about radical generosity throughout this series, I want to lay a framework, framework today by combating a lie that so many people adopt as their own truth when it comes to radical generosity. Now, we're going to be very practical for the rest of this series. Next week, we're going to talk about how we can start to cultivate a lifestyle of generosity, what conditions are needed, our worldview. Then I'm going to share about debt and, and budgeting and saving. We're going to be very practical on how to manage our money. But none of it is going to make a difference if we don't first attack the lie that way too many people believe as it comes to radical generosity. Here's what it is. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Studies show that note takers are 99% more likely to go to heaven. Um, that's a made up stat. I don't have enough money to be radically generous. That is number one lie in so many, so many people's lives. When it comes time to give, financially to make a difference where our money with our money the lie that creeps in is well I just I just don't have enough I don't have enough money to be radically generous what's so sneaky about this lie is it sounds so good it actually it can justify our lack of generosity by using our lack of resources and we can start to play out scenarios. Yeah, but of course they give. Look at their job. If I had their job, then I would give. If I had more money, then I would give. And so I want to attack this lie head on today. And I want to let you know where we're going before we get there. Radical generosity has little to do with the dollar amount as much as it has to do with your attitude and your heart. Let's say it again. Radical generosity has way less to do with a dollar amount as much as it has to do with the attitude of your heart. For proof, read the story where Jesus saw a poor widow go to church, put two pennies in the offering basket, and he said she's given more than anybody today. I mean, she's given more. It's two pennies. Yeah, but it was an overflow of a radically generous attitude. And so as we learn to grow in radical generosity, what we're really attacking is not the wallet as much as it is our hearts. We want to be radically generous. I want you to have the privilege on that moment during our service when we say we are radically generous for you to know, and I'm a part of that. Yes. Not about the dollar amount, but I, I make a difference because I live radically generous. So this is the lie. I don't have enough money to be radically generous. I want you to discover today this truth. Every person, every person has the potential to be radically generous. That's the actual truth that's going to combat the lie. And we're going to turn to God's word in a moment to see that. But just like every single one of these seeds in the right has the potential to become a seed-bearing tree, you and I, as followers of Jesus, who have been changed by his love, have the potential now, we're going to see what we do with that potential is up to us. And to see that, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 25. So before we read, I want to give you guys some context about what we're going to read today. Matthew 25 is a moment where Jesus is teaching about his return. He is getting his disciples ready for this truth, and it is our hope today. Someday, Jesus is going to return. Who's thankful for that truth this morning? That's our hope. Someday he's going to return. And he's telling his disciples, here's how you live in light of my return. Here's how you are to manage your finances. Here's how you are to manage your relationships, manage your time. He's saying, I'm coming back someday. And here's how you're going to live until I get there. And he tells these stories to try and give us some idea on how to live. 
And so in Matthew 25, he tells the story that's been called the parable, which simply means it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, the parable of the talents. And understand the word talent there isn't about like your dancing skills, although some of you are very talented in dance. <laughs> He's talking about money. Talent was a form of currency in this day. So in the NIV that we'll read from, it'll just replace the word talent with gold because we can understand it a little better. And here's what Jesus says. Again, and he says again because he's already talked about this, his return, it, and the it is his return. It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Pause for a second. Jesus is saying, here's what my return is going to be like. It's just like a man went on his, a journey. We're going to discover the man represents God and the servants represent the people of God. And what does the man do with his wealth? What's the word there? Let's say it together. He what? Entrusts. He entrusted them. He says, I'm going away. I'm coming back. But while I'm away, I'm going to trust you with what I have. Understand the first part of this. God trusts you with his stuff. God trusts you with his stuff. When we say, I don't have enough money to be radically generous, we're looking at the stuff that God has given us, trusted us with, and saying, it's just not enough. You should trust me with a little more. How many of you have ever had an experience where a friend lent you something of value? I know I have. I also know I've had moments where I've denied borrowing something of value because I don't want to accidentally break it. Like, there's no way I'm bar borrowing your power tool. I don't want your car. I don't want to have to make the phone call that I hit somebody. Thank you. I'll figure this out another way. Right? Because when we borrow something and when we live with that awareness that this is not actually mine, a healthy person will take more care of it. Like, I know I've got to give this back and I want to make sure I give it back in a very nice condition because we recognize this isn't mine. It belongs to you. And watch this. Everything you have is on loan from the Lord. It's all his. It's all his. Everything you have is actually his stuff. No, 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 Pastor Keith, but I worked really hard for the degree that led to the job that now I have the income. And who gave you breath? And who so graciously planted you in this time in human history so that you could get the degree get the job, and have the income. It's all his. Don't take my word for it. Look at the psalmist. He says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. It's all his. In fact, I want you to say that with me because it's a freedom statement. Come on. It's all his. It's all his. You and I are not owners. We're managers. And when we have that perspective, we start to chip away at the lie that says, I don't have enough to be radically generous. Because instead, we recognize all that I have is his anyway. And if I'm going to manage it, I want to manage it well, as if the one who trusted me with it was managing it. And what kind of a God do we serve? A radically generous one. I, I love this verse in Hebrews. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. I feel like if I knew how to build a house and I was a contractor, that would be my tagline on my van. Because that's like my out. If the house doesn't come out good, sorry, bro, God built it. <laughs> he made me, I built it, my bad. His bad. <laughs> you know, like, but just, just look at that. Like, you've got, you've got a house, you, you're a student here, you've got a room in your house, you, you've got a place that you're going home to. Okay, so here's a very practical exercise I want all of us to engage in. When you get wherever you're going after this, home that you own, rent, bedroom, whatever. I want you to walk in and I want you to say, this is not my house. Let's practice it. This is not my house. Because what you're doing is you're reminding yourself that all that you have is actually his. This is a freedom way to live. This is the beauty of knowing Jesus. You want to know the, the peace that comes in knowing, Lord, all that I'm experiencing, all that I have comes from you. You are in full control. May I be the best manager you have. That's way different than living closed-fisted, anxious, worrying about our stuff and if we have enough and now I got to be generous. And 
That's not a manager's mentality. That's an owner's mentality. The owner owns it all and said, here, I'm going to entrust you with this stuff. Come on, you've said something like that before. Oftentimes, though, it's out of frustration. How many of you have called up your spouse and said, your kids, <laughs> you're not going to believe what your son did. Just wait till you, all, right? We have no problem not taking ownership when there's a problem, <laughs> right? I, I'm going to confess something. I love you, Blaze Church. But over this past pandemic year, the amount of times I, could, I called up to Jesus and I said, this is your church, bro. Come on, man. Like you promised you built this church, especially when I dressed up as a bunny and visited 80 houses. Who remembers that last year? I right? just went around and I was just driving with a bunny costume. It's very fun to drive as a bunny. People look at you very differently in your cars. Look over, <laughs> give a little wave, keep driving. Right? We have no problem saying this is not mine when it's not going the way we want. But oftentimes when things are good and we're content, we drift way too far into ownership. And then we're not ready to be generous. And the master in this story entrusts them with his wealth. Let's keep going because we're only one verse in and I've been up here for 20 minutes. Let's go. He says this, to the one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag each according to his ability, then he went on his journey. I got to stop again because this verse messes with me. This verse pushes against the cultural narrative that says every person should have equal opportunity to do anything they want to do. And if you don't like who you are, change who you are. And if you want to achieve anything, just go for it. You have no limits. See, I recognize that I have limits. Despite desire in a certain direction, I am limited in my capacity. I found this out last year when I tried to golf. You were there. I felt so bad, all the grass I destroyed. I mean, it was just a 2020 destruction of grass. Every time I got on, got on, I was like, I'm done with this. It's just not who I am. See, we live in a culture that, that tells us don't let anybody stop you from being who you want, doing what you want becoming what you want, achieving what you want. And the narrative sounds good, but how about this narrative? You have a heavenly father who knows you so well. He knit you together in your mother's womb. You are wonderfully and beautifully created. You don't have to compare yourself to someone else. He's given you what you need according to your ability. Is that not freedom? Because guys, I'm done falling into the comparison trap. And social media doesn't make it any easier. You look out and say, how come their life looks like this? How come their kids are achieving this? How come we have to struggle? How come they have that? And all we're doing is comparing ourselves to a highlight reel of someone else's life when instead we could find freedom by saying, you've given me what I need according to my abilities, Jesus. You've been specific and strategic to say, here, five bags, two bags, one bag. And the one with one was no less love than the one with five. The master was just intentional to say, here's what I believe you could manage well if you'll trust me. So the lie that says, I don't have enough to be radically generous, you've got to realize this truth. God has given you what you need because he knows you. Don't wait for more before you make a decision to be radically generous. What if you realized today and decided all that I have is from the master and he's given me just the right amount to be a manager of what I have? I have a pastor friend that's always reminding me, Keith, when you compare you will despair. When you start looking elsewhere and saying, yeah, but what about our church? What about me? What about my life? What about this? You will despair at what you have instead of being grateful for what you have. Guys, we got to recognize we have a loving master who has said, here, here's five. Here's two. Here's one. Use it well. Be good. Be faithful with it. Grow in radical generosity. I love what Peter, the, the disciple, writes. And I think Peter wrote this because Peter needed to be reminded of this probably more than any other disciple. He said, by his divine power, God has given us, what does that say? Everything. Not most things, not some things. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. The man who wrote that verse verbally denied Jesus in front of people. He actually tried to stop Jesus from going to the cross and he cut off a guy's ear at a prayer service. I mean, you can't get much worse than that. And yet Jesus restored him and loved him. And he goes on to say, wow, God's given me everything I need to live for him. What a humble attitude as it relates to living radically generous. All that you have belongs to him. And he has so graciously and intentionally given you what you need to live for him. 
So what did these servants do? The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work, and he gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. I wonder what caused the man that had one bag to decide, I'm just going to hide it in the ground. And we don't have to wonder because he's going to tell us in a few moments. But do you notice what the ones with the five and the two did? It says that they put their money to work. They used it. Now, I want to be very clear about this story. Remember, Jesus is telling us a story about how to live as his disciples in light of his return, waiting for his return. This is not a story where Jesus is telling us how to be saved and become one of his disciples. I need to make this clear for you. You are saved by the work of Jesus Christ alone, and that's it. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. Jesus paid the price for your sins because he loves you. He died on the cross for you, and it is fully accomplished by him alone. That's grace. And we receive that gift of grace by confessing, Lord, I need you, and I believe in Jesus. I surrender to you. But too often what happens after we say the prayer or make the decision is I think visually we think we get a go into heaven bus ticket, sit at the bus stop and wait for the heaven express to come and pick us up and we don't do anything else. And then we don't live the abundant life that Jesus actually has for us. We just, I'm saved. Guess that's it. And yet Jesus said, abundant life. You will do greater things than even I do. Paul says, work out your salvation, which means now that you've received it, now we're going to work it out into our lives. Our marriages are going to look different. Our relationships are going to look different. The way we spend our time is going to look different. The things that we say yes to and say no to is going to look different, and our money is going to look different. And so these servants, they put it to work. They said, I'm not going to hide this, except for that one man. So what happens? After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I love these words good and faithful servant. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. Before we see the master's reply, if we lean into a culture of comparison, and if we believe that radical generosity has all to do with amounts, then what we should expect the master to say next is, why couldn't you gain as much as the other guy? What do you mean you only got two back? This guy got five. I mean, he's got mansions in heaven. I got to put you up in a cottage now, bro. I don't, it doesn't work that way. Okay, you can laugh there. It's a joke, all right? But here, here, like, if we expect that level of response from the Lord, if we're living in the comparison trap, if we're believing the lie that says, I don't have enough to be radically generous, then the master should reply differently to the one who only got two bags. After all, he only got two. He didn't make a difference. At least he didn't make as big a difference as the other guy. Look at what the master says. You've heard it already. Same reply. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. There's a big truth to discover here, guys. The identical statement of praise to both servants shows us that the master is more concerned with faithfulness to the gift of potential than he is with the actual amount that is received. That's liberating. What that means for us is radical generosity, what's our truth, is available to every person. It's not based on how much you have today. Because God has trusted you with his stuff. He's given you the right amount. And you and I, like every one of these seeds, have the potential to make a difference. And the master says, share my happiness. 
But what about the one who hid it? His master, oh, we'll go to verse uh, 24. The man who had received one bag of gold came and said, Master, I know that you are a hard man. You're harvesting where you have not sown. You're gathering where you have not scattered seed. And here's why he hid it. Verse 25. So I was, say the word with me, afraid. I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. See, here it is. This is what belongs to you. This servant was motivated by fear. I love the acronym for fear. Fear is false evidence appearing real. It's not actually real, but we adopt it as reality. And this servant was motivated by fear, and the false evidence that he grabbed was that he was more an owner than a manager of what was given to him. He allowed fear to grip him and say, I can't live generously. What if I need this someday? He forgot that his God owns everything in the world. Don't you believe that if God is calling you to be radically generous and open-handed, it's because he's able to bless you with more and he'll meet every one of your needs? But fear will convince you, hide it, hold on to it. You need it. You don't know what's coming down the line. Make sure you're taken care of. You don't have enough to be radically generous. And he hides it in the ground. And he makes this statement, Master, I know that you're a hard man. Because I'm seeing a master who's not a hard man, but a generous man that's entrusted all of his wealth to all of his servants. He doesn't actually know the master. Maybe the reason why you struggle with radical generosity is because you don't actually know the master yet. And if you would know the radical generosity of your God, then being radically generous would just be a byproduct and a result of receiving his radical generosity. How many are thankful that our God is radically generous and that he's not stingy? That he's not the one saying, I don't know about trusting you, man. God opens his hands and says, I love the whole world. I will send my son to this world. This servant, he's afraid. So how will the master reply? His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. I do not want to hear that. Wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Oh, you think you know this about me? All right. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I I would have received it back with interest. Like the very least you could have done is got me like that 0.0111% interest rate on your savings account, like just something there. You didn't even do that. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. There's a principle here. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. And you might say again, well, that's not fair. How come he's getting more? because he was faithful with a little and God knew he could trust him with more. God trusted all of his servants with something, but the one with the five showed, I can trust you with more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Or if you want to get real spiritual, you say, good gnashing of teeth. And just bring the G in there, make it a little more scary. Right? Now, there's a lot we could debate about this passage, and I don't want to get into it with you right now. About the end times and this and that and all that. Remember, Jesus is telling us how to live in light of the truth that he's going to return. So here's the primary thing we need to walk away with this morning. How you live, which includes how you give, matters. It matters. There's all scripture that tells us it matters. We are called to live radically generous. We're called to be radically generous, not just in our finances, but in our relationships, the way we extend love and forgiveness to others. That matters. We're called to be radically generous in our time. That's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Two didn't want to invest their time. One did. We're we're called to live differently, Blaze Church. That's how we are going to be trailblazers that blaze the way for people to know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. We've got to live radically generous. 
We've got to be moving at a pace where we can recognize the hurting and the broken around us. And we've got to be willing to say, this isn't mine, so God, use it for the good of others. I want to be a blessing to other people. This servant, he was motivated by fear. But what I need you to realize is this. Each servant had the same choice to make. Each one of us has the same potential to be radically generous. Don't believe the lie that you need more to start living radically generous. You and I get to be radically generous. We don't give to get. We get to give. It's a privilege to be a blessing. It's a privilege to live open-handed. You know, this parable is not explicitly about finances. I get that. But it's not not about it because it's about our whole lives. It's about being faithful with what God has given us now. Your life, your dreams, your goals, your relationships, your stuff. How are you managing it? Are you radically? Because we want you to experience the joy and the blessing of being radically generous. And it begins with this foundation. I can be radically generous, not because I'm good, but because he is radically generous. That's gospel motivation. In a few weeks, I'm going to share with you a passage of scripture from Corinthians that says we give in response to the great giving of our God. Like that's the gospel. He was radically generous. He became poor so that you and I might become rich in him. So when we give, when we choose to worship in radical generosity, we are following in the example of our generous God. He was the master in the story that entrusted his wealth to all the servants. And he is our master today that has said, everything you have comes from my hand. Live radically generous. Today is really just about getting you to start turning the wheels in your mind. What would life be like if you lived radically generous? If you said, you know, this is what I'm giving now, but it's not radically generous. I'm going to trust the Lord with his stuff and I'm going to give. I'm excited because this series also leads us into our end of the year offering. So last year as a church, we were gearing up for this, what we are now, Blaze Church Portable. How many of you guys were part of Blaze Church during that season? You can raise your hand, see it out there. Yeah, so what we did last year around this time is we shared some vision that God gave us that our building was too small. It actually didn't even require a vision. It just required you being in the building to know that that was true. It's like, yeah, I recognize building's too small. Like kids are falling downstairs. It's just great. Just pile everybody up. So we said, what if we could become Blaze Church Portable? And the radical generosity of trailblazers made this happen. In fact, we believed God for this certain amount and we just blew it out of the water because of radical generosity. We ended up blessing other organizations from that. And now we're seeing the fruit of that. These walls, this stage, everything that you see that in about 30 minutes is going to get put into a box and put in the corner of the room. So this year, as we're getting ready for our end of the year offering, and we're going to preach on living radically generous, I'm excited where we are as a church. Because we believe the day is coming where we'll have a permanent facility. That's right, setup team right there. It's a strong amen from a setup team member. I'm with you, bro. I mean, I just don't want to run cables no more and fix chairs, but I'll do it for the glory of God. You should join that team. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need you. You need that. But it's fun. It's it's fun. We're a portable church. We're looking for that permanent facility, the facility where we have a vision. You guys know this. We have a vision for our permanent facility to actually have laundromat service in it for free laundromat for this community because they need that. How cool is that? Like we want to make sure there's a washer dryer for people in the community to come in, get your clothes clean because we know that's a need here. Like we've got, we've got vision for that. We're excited. So for this year, we're like, okay, well, like we're good, right? Ash, Ash is a board member. We're good. Like the church budget is just growing. People are giving. We're blessing people. It's crazy. So what, we could just like bank this and get ready for the building. We could do that. Or, or we could say, you know what? What if every dollar that comes in, we give it all away? Like all of it. We just say, okay, here's where I'm going to go seeds a little bit. No, seeds, okay? We want to sow some seeds out into the world, not here, because we believe in biblical principles of sowing and reaping. And that's biblical. Just, God, we just want to throw this out there, not so that we can reap, but so that the gospel of Jesus can advance around the world. Because you've given us so much. So we just want to sow it. We want to throw it out there. 
So this year, we're gearing up for what we're calling our seed offering on December 12th. December 12th, you got, you got a whole month and some weeks to plan and prepare. But what we're doing this year as a seed offering is every dollar is actually going to leave Blaze Church and make a difference somewhere else. Yeah, we're excited about that. And so our vision and our goal is that we believe easily Blaze Church can see $30,000 in our seed offering easily. And so we said, what if we take the 30000 and we slice it up into thirds and do 10000 locally in Riverhead, 10000 nationally in our country, and 10000 globally for the advancing of God's word? Do you guys want to know where we're going to give it to? If you don't want to know, I won't tell you. You can come back to the 930. They, they don't want to, do you want to know where I'm going to give it to? Anybody want to know? All right, thank you. A little bit, a little bit of enthusiasm. So locally, we want to make a difference. And there are some beautiful organizations that are already just, they're doing it. They're just, they're making a difference in people's lives. And so we want to be a blessing to Timothy Hill Ranch and all that they're doing in this community. Yeah, we want to be a blessing for Maureen's Haven that's serving the homeless in this community. For Lighthouse Missions that's meeting food insecurity right here in this community. Actually for Riverhead CAP. So I love this. They're in Riverhead High School Community Awareness Program and they are educating and helping students that have fallen into this lie of vaping, drugs, and alcohol. And we just want to say here's some money so we can break that stronghold in this community. And working with an organization, uh, Association of Mental Health and Wellness, which you may not even know, we blessed them with 50 backpacks this year because you gave so much that we went and bought them backpacks with supplies. And now we want to financially just bless what they're doing. The other cool thing we're going to do locally is this. We're spearheading this as a church, but we're working with other organizations. During the holidays, it's really when you see the biggest needs surface in families' lives. Right, so on your chair, you had a list of items to bring in for our Build a Basket, and we're going to be doing that for the next few weeks, and you'll hear more about that, but start shopping. We're going we're to have that, but the other thing that tends to happen during the holidays is a toy drive. We'll bring in toys, and we'll bless the community by bringing them to the school. This year, we have a vision to set up Blaze Church Building as a toy store. So watch how cool this is. We're actually going to buy a bunch of toys, stock it with shelves. Like when you walk in, it will feel like you're in a toy store. We're working with the social workers in the school to identify families who can never afford to go shopping at Walmart. Yeah. Or Toys R Us. And they're going to come shop at Blaze Church and Blaze Church Dream Teamers are then going to wrap the gifts, pray with the families, and those parents are going to go home heroes on Christmas morning. That is awesome. And we're really excited about that this season. Nationally, we started connecting with some ARC churches. So we are an ARC church. It's an association of related churches, just a community, a tribe of churches, national and global. And I reached out and they had given us a list of about eight different churches that are starting in the Northeast area in the next year. And so we're praying through this list right now and we're gonna have one church off that list that we're gonna write a $10,000 check to on the day that they open their doors. How awesome is that to say, here, just go, like just take this and just use it to bring Jesus to your community. And then globally, this week, Amy started looking into some organizations and some ways that we can actually build a water filtration treatment plant in a village around the world so that that village can have access to clean waters and we're going to pay for the whole thing. How awesome is that? That we're going to say this village now is going to have access to clean water. And I think the budget's going to allow us to even buy some goats and chickens and farm animals because that actually matters too in that village to provide some food source. Blaze Church, this is radical generosity. This is us saying we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. You know, the next parable he tells tells us that whenever you do to the least of these, you do to him. Yes. When you give a cup of cold water in his name, it's giving it for Jesus. When you feed someone, when you clothe someone. And here's, here's my passion as your pastor, and you know this about our culture, because we're not passing the plate today. I'm not telling you if you sow, you're going to get. Our culture is simply this. You want to experience the joy that comes with radical generosity because you were created to. You were created to know that joy that comes where you remember, I was a part of that. I invested. Jesus says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. You want to be connected to some of the things we're talking about? Invest your treasure in that direction. These are biblical principles for our finances. But it starts with breaking down this lie. I can't be radically generous. I don't have enough. That's not true. The master has given you exactly what you need.
Trust the one who trusts you. Would you stand up with me? I want to pray a very specific prayer, and then we're going to respond with a song of worship. The prayer I want to pray today, and team, you can join me. I want to pray specifically against the enemy this morning. Because I know in a message like this and a series like this, he's, how many know one of the names of the enemy is the father of lies? He's just a liar. That's what he does. Jesus says when he speaks, it's just all lies. It's his native tongue. He's a liar. And what the enemy can do with a message like this is he can begin to plant seeds of doubt and lies in our hearts. He can have us walk out of here and say, you see, there's another church talking about money. That's all they're after. And get us to start to close our fists around what we have. And I want to pray against his lies that are going to come at us during these four weeks. And instead, I want to pray that we would be soft and receptive to the truth of God's word that says what we learned. Everything I have is his. He trusts me with it. I'm going to live radically generous. So would you receive this prayer this morning? Father, I pray right now for soft hearts. Lord, I pray against those lies that will come. Maybe they come from past experiences. Maybe from experiences of, of others that they've shared. Yeah, this is what I found in a church where there was manipulation, false teaching around this beautiful area of money. God, may we instead be open to what you have for us. May we live and give the way you have. Jesus, you came because of radical generosity. May we embrace this truth today that every one of us has the potential to be radically generous, that we want to go from being a seed to one who multiplies. And so God, do a work in our hearts this week as we prepare ourselves for next Sunday and for all that you'll show us through your word. May we have open hands and a soft heart. We love you, Lord. Thank you for being generous towards us. In your name, amen.